Either this, so that's an interesting question. So I'll be at least a friend, and either this ring or Students, we need to get started looking at the clock, and there is so much to cover this afternoon, and I just learned something so exciting that I can't wait to share it with you as an advocate speaker, who is also one of our teaching assistants this semester. Bobby Goldsmith has offered to invest some of his precious time talking to us about a portion of his master's research. What I just learned is um, he is considering staying on for his doctorate degree. I, I can't tell you how wonderful that news is to hear if it, if it well, whatever, wherever he does, what we want this young man, we want him to be comfortable, whatever, whatever decision he makes. What matters, Avi, is that you go, you, you go and you do what you think you should go and do. And if it's here, we all benefit. Or, but wherever it is, everyone's going to benefit. There's no question about it. Students, our plan is to walk out of this room uh, in about half an hour, 40, 30, 30, 40 minutes. We'll get on a motor pool bus that will be ready at, at 2.15 to take us downtown. There is, there's, uh, something's happened downtown. I've not been able to reach either the, the, the new interim, he's an interim director, and the person that's in charge of, of most of what I want to see. There's some something going on down there that I don't understand. I've had trouble connecting with them. But it's a very, very course relevant stop for us to make. And so we'll go down there, we'll, we'll park, we'll get out of the bus, we'll walk down the hill, go in the basement of the building, the old ag building. This is where the soil testing lab used to be a long time ago before it moved out to, to um, where it was and then relocated to where it is. It used to be on, on a, different, a different location than where it is now. And I'm, I said to Avi, I said, Avi, you're going to talk about our future. And he corrected me. He said, this is today. This is our present. So, and he also said, none of this belongs to Vladimir. So, Avi, on behalf of all of us, thank you for giving us your time this afternoon. Yeah, thank you so much. We are so... Yeah, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Patterson. So, yep, my, my name is Avi Goldsmith. I'll, uh, I'll give like a little intro in, in the next slide, but I just wanted to take a second to yeah, talk would you, about it. Would you share a bit about who Avi, who in the world is Avi? <laughs> I, I, that's, that's, that's my first slide. Um, who in the but, world is this? Yeah, I'm, I am right? just a person. Um, but yeah, just, I, I really like this picture because it has nothing to do with my research, but we, we got out to a field site. This is now, this is A, and this is B, and this is C. I like B. A, B. That's perfect. So this has nothing to do with my research here. It's a... Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have done research oh. with other labs. Um, oh my this is the peanut belt research station in Lewiston. And we, you know, we're just minding our own business, doing our thing, and all of a sudden we heard this crackling noise. And suddenly we looked across that tree line, and it's like, oh, there's a raging fire going on. Like, what the heck is happening? Um, so I had my drone, and just real quick, 
busted on up there and got this picture and did confirm it was it was on purpose. It was a controlled burn. There was like two, you can't see them in the picture or you can just like down there, but it was, I don't know what the experiment was, but it was a controlled burn. There was somebody with like a propane tank. So now where was this again? In Lewiston. In Lewiston. At the peanut belt research station. So, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, so I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is just about five miles north of Washington, D.C. You're and I got not a Baltimore my, Orioles fan, are you? Uh, I, I don't really watch baseball. So. Okay, okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, and I got my B.S. in Environmental Science and Technology from the University of Maryland. And it was while I was at Maryland that I took a class I had to for my major, Intro to Soil Science. And that just, it just kind of struck a nerve and really got me interested in agriculture and agricultural research. So I reached out to a lab um, at a nearby USDA ARS uh, research center that was just two miles up the road and got an undergraduate internship there, which then turned into after I graduated, I worked there full time for a few years until I came here. And while there, I got to do all kinds of research on weeds, different cover crops, different management systems, really got quite a wide breadth of experience and actual hands-on in the field doing field work. And I feel like I learned everything that I needed for my master's there, way more there than I did just in my like formal education. So just really getting your hands dirty is an extremely valuable experience. And so then when I came to NC State, I, uh, I'm a master's student oh under, my gosh, what a pitch. Uh, what under a the pitch. supervision of Dr. Ramon Leon Gonzalez, who does weed biology and ecology. And so a lot of the studies that I helped out with back in Maryland had to do with weed science and weed ecology. So it was something that really piqued my interest. And one of the cool things about coming here, too, is I had an opportunity to really be hands-on with designing my own project. I knew from some of my work at BARC, uh, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, that I really liked some of the more technolo technological side of agriculture. The person I worked for there also really assured me that that's where a lot of like the jobs are going to be in the future. So I knew I really wanted to get involved in that. I'd done some work on various imaging systems, so but I had never had any experience with drones. And so Ramon is the one that, that really introduced me to that. And I won't have... I probably won't have time to get into any of my research today, but this is all going to be stuff that I learned while doing that. And so, yep, this is a picture of the lab. A lot of the people in this picture have already graduated, and that's me doing a cover crop experiment back in the in the spring, I believe. So, kind of doing it, just diving right into the drones. Uh, some of the functions of unmanned aerial systems, or UAS, which that encompasses the drone, the camera, all of it. So really one of the main benefits to, to farmers and growers is that it allows for efficient and flexible field scouting. So instead of needing to get in a truck and drive around the field in order to see, you know, check up on, oh, is this, I know this area has problems of drainage. Let's see how that's doing after the storm, or I know... There's some nutrient problems here. Oh, I saw some, you know, root rust or whatever on some of the plants. Let me go drive to that part of the field and check it out. Now someone can just, with one of those drones, that, that one on the left there, the whole package with the drone batteries and everything is $1,300, which really isn't that much. You can just take up to the sky and just go wherever you want to go and see things, and it makes it super easy. Also for extension agents, if they want to talk to their growers that they're working with about some of the problems they're facing, they can just fly the drone and have that grower look right at their iPad and get a live view of whatever they're seeing and then take pictures and look back at stuff later. So it has a real, real advantage for also tracking change over time. There's ways that you can do repeatable missions or you can also just, if you remember generally, where you went to take a picture. You can go back there every week, every month, as, as often as you want to. You know, even later on that day after an herbicide application or something. Some of the more advanced metrics uh, allow for data-driven decision-making, which some of the more entry-level drones might have a little bit of trouble doing that just because of software issues. And 
as I said, repeatable image collections. And then also what's great is all these drones have GPS systems and then so all those pictures are geo-referenced. So if you pull up, um, all images have something called metadata, which is just other forms of information that are stored in that image. And so there's some coordinates that are in there so you can see exactly where that picture was taken, which can help you go back to a certain location in the future. This is incredible. This and is incredible. This is a picture. You can you can kind of see me right there. This is a, a corn experiment that I was taking some images of. And so that, that field scouting um, function of drones is something I kind of termed search and locate. And so what that's really good for is identifying some of the larger issues that I was talking about. General crop field health issues you might be having identifying weed patches, even some stuff with nutrient deficiencies. And so that can give you live feedback. It's easy to collect. All you have to, literally all you have to do is fly and take pictures. You don't even need to take those pictures. You could just be looking at that live feed. And then it still does give you the ability to do some further processing through ArcGIS, through R, um, QGIS, all these different softwares, some of which are free, some are not. And the other great thing is that these are possible with, I would say, not most, but all drones. Um, cheap, expensive, they can all fly up and take pictures. Some are just gonna have better camera resolution than others. But one of the drawbacks of this is that, as you can see here, you get this really large perspective. So you can get a big sense of what's going on in general. And that moved a little bit, but when you try to get into some of the finer details, it's a bit harder to see things. So I think, so what do you guys, what are some things that you think are going on right here? If you can see it, I know it might be a bit hard to see. You think that's an area where the corn is doing really well, or it's doing poor, or there's weeds? It's certainly different. It's, it's different in the students. Yeah, you, you can tell that here, there's definitely no weeds. But, you know, compared to that versus that, it's a little bit hard to tell what exactly is different. So when you zoom in closer, and I had to actually fly the drone in closer manually do that, you can see that it was actually just absolutely run over by weeds. Um, the yield from this plot, I just got it was horrible compared to all the other plots. Each plot in this experiment is just four rows, four corn rows by I believe it's 30 feet long. Um, so that's, that's an issue where search and locate is really good for identifying those more major issues. But if you wanna get more detail, you're gonna have to go and fly in closer. And so there's some other considerations one, according to the FAA, we're limited to 400 feet in altitude, and that's more of a safety thing because you never know where there might be manned vehicles, um, oh, manned aerial vehicles. Of that. And I this is all unmanned, of course. Yeah. yeah so, and and that that is something that you would be surprised how often there are airplanes that fly relatively low. There's tons of small regional airports that you're probably not aware of or even military bases. Um, this was actually taken in Goldsboro, North Carolina, which is in the, in the airspace of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. So every time I wanna fly there, I have to call the Air Force Base and I actually had to get special authorization to be able to fly there. And just a few weeks ago, I got a call. Normally, it's all smooth, but I actually got a call from air traffic control telling me there was a helicopter doing some scouting or just doing some scouting on some power lines and that they were flying pretty low. So it's a really important thing for, for safety because, you know, the drone will lose, but you don't, you don't want to endanger anyone else's life. Also, one of the problems, too, is that for this experiment in particular, this is a hemp experiment looking at uh, different fiber that I took for Dr. David Suchoff. And so you can see here, and this is on purpose, that, that it's cut off. You don't actually see what goes beyond there, and that's because I just wasn't able to get to a height high enough in order to capture the entire field in one image. So that's something that you'll have to 
have one of the drawbacks of just doing that basic search and locate manual flying. And so, kind of similar to last time, you know, you can you can see from this plot that it's a lot cleaner. I can tell you that the experiment had a lot of different nitrogen rates. That's what they were that's what they were teaching, but it's so you can generally tell which plots had higher nitrogen treatments, which ones had lower, but you can't really say anything specific about that plot. And when you go in closer, you can see part of the reason it's so green is because it just has a lot of weeds. I believe, um, as this, this wasn't my study, I believe they might have had some mixtures in there as well. But just that's an important consideration is it's, the search and locate is good for big picture kind of measurements, not necessarily these finer details. And so that, one of the things that can kind of bridge that gap is called orthomosaicing or mapping. And this is one of the more advanced features that some of these drones can't do. Um, and it's what I use for all of my research. And it's the main thing that people use for agricultural research, which is where you open up your, uh, your tablet or your flight controller and it'll have some piece of software where you can draw this boundary and set various parameters and it'll just go fly and take hundreds of pictures wow, of that area. And then you go into another piece of software and it's able to stitch all those photos together to create one massive photo. So this one in particular was also from Lewiston. Um, it's of a rye variety trial looking at this something called allelopathy. I don't know if that's something that you guys have covered in class. No, we've not covered it yet, but we have a, a world authority. I, Tammy, can, uh, Dr. Udo Bloom over, I still say botany. She's retired. He's a world authority on allelopathy. He's going to give us a lecture on allelopathy. And so I took this flight at 40 feet, which then when you put those things into the software, it does the math with the resolution of the camera and the height. And so that gives you 0.33 centimeters or 0.13 inches per pixel. Um, and it creates a massive photo. So this, the raw version of this photo is 1.2 gigabytes. And I actually, this is a uh, discard. Give me a second. Students, this is your future. I actually Maybe have. it's your present. So this is, I, I converted this to a JPEG, so it's not as big as the TIFF file. Um, what, t TIFF files, basically, they just have more information in them. I don't, I couldn't say exactly why. But, so this is, it, it has basically the same resolution. And so you can see when you zoom in. Oh, my gosh. It has an extremely high. Oh, my gosh level of detail and you can really see all the this is incredible. everything that's going on and the benefit too of this is that you can just if you were to take one picture of this you'd have no idea where that is in the field you, you, you just can't center yourself but then you can just zoom out and you know exactly where that was and since these are repeatable you can compare those over time over dates and it'll do the exact same flight so it's really, really valuable stuff. And you put those into programs like ArcGIS and other things to get more data out of it, more map. Someone's having a party. So. And so this is actually one of my plots that was harvested a few weeks ago um, in Goldsboro. You can kind of see me in the green <laughs> down there. And so, uh, what are this, you doing down there? Just one one of the nice things about doing drone research is that some of these flights take a little while, so it just gives you like 20, 25 minutes to kind of just sit there and just take take a little break because there's nothing you can really do while it's happening. The drone does it for you. Yeah, the the drone totally flies itself. Right while you do that, so one of the disadvantages of doing that mapping stuff is you really it's really important to have as consistent weather conditions as possible while it's doing that flight. And so for me, in this flight, I looked at the weather, it said it was gonna to be totally cloudy, I thought it was good, and then I got there and the sun is constantly going behind clouds, coming out of clouds, just rotating between sunny and cloudy, which is what you don't want. So you want a consistent uh, aerial 
whatever. Because what you'll see is that when the drone was taking pictures towards the bottom of the map here, it was cloudy. But then when it was up here, it was sunny. And so when you then go into ArcGIS to do some, some more analysis, that can really throw off your values because corn looks totally different down here than it does up here just because it has more sun, it's brighter. And so that's one of, that's, that's arguably the largest, other than money, the largest limitation is it's, you just, you can look at the weather all you want, but a lot of times you'll get to the field and it is what it is and you have to just, some is data it, is better than no data. Is it better to go out on a day when there are relatively few and preferably no clouds in the sky? I'd say it's better to fly when it's completely cloudy because then you're not going to have shadows or as many shadows. So also generally you want to... Completely cloudy. You, if it's fully sunny, you're going to want to fly between 12 and 2 o'clock because that's when the sun is the highest and you get the least amount of shadows. So actually in, in this one, I'd done a, my, the first flight I did for this, I did it at like 10 or 9.30, and because the rye was so much taller than everything else, there was just massive shadows. And so it just, we weren't able to see a lot. Um, to interrupt you, but can you use your system to identify which which kind of plant is down there, which kind of weed is that one? And what is, can you, is it possible to identify the uh, type of plant that, so what, what I've been doing for my research is something called classification. And so I've been having it identify corn versus weeds, but in terms of different species of weeds, that's especially that because that you, they're so small, you need, yeah. if you were to have a really high resolution camera, you, maybe. You, yeah. you maybe could, but with drones, that's, that's not really there yet. Um, okay. You know, I'm sure it could tell the difference between corn and soybean. Yeah. You know, soybean and cotton, that kind of stuff. And and that classification starts to fall apart of it when it gets really dense. So you know, and it's understandable. And this picture here, you know, that that would be pretty hard for it to be able to tease apart the weeds yeah. from yeah. the from the corn. We understand that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't have too much time left, but I just wanted to get briefly into some of the more, even more advanced things. Um, I don't have the drone with me today, but the drone that I had taken all these pictures with is the Mavic 3 Multispectral. And so that has both an RGB camera, which is just, you know, a regular camera like you have on your phones, but it also has four multispectral cameras. And that just means that instead of capturing light, and the entire visible spectrum, which is here, light is essentially just wavelengths measured in nanometers. Each of these lenses captures light only within a smaller range of those wavelengths. So you get near infrared, which is beyond what we can actually see with our own two eyes. It has 860 nanometers plus or minus 26. And so that allows you to isolate some key measurements um, some crop responses. So you can see here, healthy vegetation really peaks in that near infrared spectrum and soil is all the way down here. So using multispectral cameras, you can get lots of measurements for different things like crop health, um, nutrients, all of that, that you just can't see with your own two eyes. And so this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of these multispectral images. All, these are these all taken at the same exact time, showing the same space. And you can just see how different each of them is represented. And they are all black and white as well because it doesn't show the full range of color. And you can really see in the near infrared how everything that has chlorophyll, everything that's alive, is just extremely white. It really just reflects the light in those wave bands where it's green and red it's just quite dark because it's absorbing the light from those bands. And so this is just an example here of that first image that I'd shown, but 
with NDVI, which is a, a vegetation indice that, that really highlights a live plant matter. So you can clearly see that these plots, that this plot here was planted at a higher density than this one because I have two different density treatments. You can see where there was patches of weeds randomly scattered throughout the field that you just wouldn't be able to point out as easily with a regular image. And so finally, some of the mapping considerations. Um, it's considerably more expensive than just, you know, going out flying a drone like normal. The, the Mavic 3 multispectral that I had used for all my research, the whole package of batteries and everything is $5,300, and that's considered cheap. Cheap. That's considered cheap. Some of the drones that other people in the department have, they have this thing called the Matrice 300 RTK. That drone is $13,500. And then they have a multispectral camera attached to it that's like $20,000. So you're looking at like a $38,000 system. So, you know, that, that makes $5,200 sound like nothing. Um, <laughs> ArcGIS Pro, that's something that's also expensive, but through NCSU, we get free access to that through your Unity ID. QGIS and R are free. They're completely open source. I use Agisoft Metashape to stitch the images together, especially the multispectral ones, and there is an educational license that makes that a lot cheaper. And then there's other services like Drone Deploy and Pix4D that are subscription-based that is what, more what a lot of growers and people actually out there trying to run a business would use because it does a lot of the processing for you. And then also storage space. You know, each time I do one of these mapping missions, I get hundreds if not thousands of images. So my, my PI bought me a four terabyte external hard drive and I've never thought I'd feel like that. That wasn't complete overkill or something like that. And and that's it. If anyone have, has any questions, I'd love to hear it. Do you have any opinions on like drone application for herbicide? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. I, so I, I, had, I had done some work with Andrew Howe, who um, just uh, graduated last spring with his PhD, so Dr. Andrew Howe, and he did a lot of work with drone spraying. It's one of those things where the technology is there, but the regulation hasn't quite caught up yet. Oh, um, it's gonna be regulated, isn't it? Yeah, so technically those drones are illegal as of now in the US, it's but a lot- Illegal? Yeah, at least illegal to use and then spray herbicides with, because as many of you probably know, the label is the law when it comes to herbicides, and very few, if any of them, are actually labeled for aerial applications in those ways. I think it is something that is very useful. I don't, I don't see it being useful in corn or anything like that where you're planting like hundreds of acres. But if you have a vineyard, if you have an orchard, if you're doing aquatic things where you can't get through with a tractor, then I think it's extremely useful. But well, I mean, there's all kinds of considerations. Well, what about if you're, you're spraying a contact herbicide, or it could be translocated? Let's say contact in this field, and you don't want you don't you don't want any of this this herbicide to get over into that field. But this wind is blowing that way, and you're now you can't go above 400 feet. Mm -hmm. But if you were to when when people fly those drone sprayers, they're going probably 30 feet. I would guess they're going a lot lower because you know when you're when you're just going through with a tractor it's just spraying it down and there's nothing else other than wind influencing that but with the drone sprayers those propellers <laughs> create all kinds of disturbances in the wind so I know when I stick around for my PhD I'm, I'll be doing some work on that you know probably droplet measurement things Drift is a big issue, so it's going to happen. It's going to come, but definitely more like studies that need to be done. You're assuming that for this kind of farming, <laughs> whatever you want to describe it, large fields are better than very small fields. Because if you've got a small field with this crop and another small field with that crop, 
you need to be uniform. I think what we hear you saying is that it's important to be spraying in a uniform tar at a uniform target. I, I don't know what I'm I'm not sure what I'm asking. It's it's important for the environmental conditions to be uniform. That that's what I'm talking. I'm talking about the environmental conditions. So like you know wind, or for, for the mapping, really the main thing that is just the sunlight. You don't want it going in and out of clouds because that's just going to mess up a lot of your data, which I've had direct direct experiences with processing some of my stuff where sure. things are just all kinds of whacked out. You've got crop A here, crop B back there. Yeah. And you, you only want to... This is your target, not that one. Yeah. So you would have some system... I don't know how to ask a question. You would have, like... Whenever you do the mapping stuff, it uses the coordinates from that box that you drew, and it follows that, that exactly. exactly. That, that helps a lot too. So when when you do the mapping, you're not actually manually flying it. It it flies itself it because flies humans itself. are naturally not oh, it flies itself. But you can also do your own. You can still take control and do manual treatments. There's, there's nothing preventing you from doing that, but if you're trying to treat a whole field and be uniform and not spray over spray or under spray, you're going to want some, you know, something more dialed in. So the system needs to be in control. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking too much. Y'all go ahead, students. We've only we've got just a few minutes. Go ahead with your questions. Yeah. Are y'all looking for any undergrad research? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I right. Right now, at the moment, I mean, we we did just get somebody in our lab, but I would I would really highly recommend that you guys look up the different labs in the department and just reach out. That makes a huge difference. We had actually our lab had put out stuff, I believe, in the spring, all kinds of things about wanting to hire undergrads, and I've, I've nobody saw, responded. I saw it this past spring. Yeah, there will be there will be opportunity. Yes. So I would highly recommend it, especially if you're thinking about grad school or research. I mean, it, not, not only the experience, but the connections. I came here because of the connections I had because of the undergraduate research that I did and just making a good impression. And that just will make your life a lot easier to make those good connections with people. So definitely reach out. There's, there's all kinds of labs doing all kinds of different things. So is your research more what the drone can do or kind of what's inside the field? So we did a lot of trials and use drones, but then we also have to go in and QC them and do all yeah. that. So. I'm, I'm doing a similar thing where I'm both using the drone and also ground truthing okay. the data just to make sure everything's right. So I, I actually had fields that were planted in corn and got harvested and sprayed and all of that. So it's a bit of both, but with the with the goal of eventually having systems in place where for mine I'm trying to predict yield loss based off of the relative leaf area of weeds in the field. And so imagine if you could, you know, earlier in the season when your corn's at like B four, B five, you could just fly your drone out, plug in all the images and it would tell you, okay, here you're predicted to have, you know, 20% yield loss because of the weeds. Yes. And so that can then help you with accounting. Depending on how fast you're able to get that turnaround, you might then want to do another spray. Um, so it's just there to help farmers and growers make more in-the-moment decisions to have more money in their pocket. I've got one question, but I want to give you all first chance. We're at time. Clock is moving. Y'all go go ahead if you have a question. Are the county agents, in, at least in certain counties, approachable and are they cooperative? Do you collaborate much to, with the county agents in that, at that level? So over the summer, I actually did two all-day workshops on this with extension agents, Wonderful. where we had them come in and I had a much longer version of this presentation. And so this drone here, we actually have five of them. And so we 
what, what we told the extension agents as part of the grant was, if you go out and get your FAA Part 107 license, which you need to have in order to legally use drones as part of work, um, if you're just doing recreational stuff, you don't need that. But for work purposes, you do. If you go out and do that and show us, we'll lend you one of those drones for a period of time at their research station. So we have one guy down in Fayetteville who just completed that. So Ramon and I are going to go out either next week or the week after to, to probably deliver that exact drone to him for a little bit. So you, you are approachable. If, with, with the proper licensing, it is possible to collaborate in the way that you're describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would definitely argue for this kind of work, it is important to get that licensing because a lot of the information on the test isn't that relevant to know, but the stuff that is is very... Now, with, how, how do the students get... To, I'm sorry, go ahead and finish. Your oh, question. yeah, with, with, especially just like with all the different flight restrictions, you know, the... The air is highly, highly regulated, especially when you're near an airport. The last thing you want is to fly your drone into an airplane and have the FAA on your ass. Um, or the Air Force. I, I don't want to get in trouble with the Air Force. So, so yeah. How do, how do our students achieve the li proper licensing? I mean, if, they, if you guys are just having a drone to fly around for fun, you don't need to go through that whole process. All you need to do is, if it's over a certain weight, you just need to register it, and that's five dollars. And but they sell they, drones that are under that weight. But let's say they do want to get the proper licensing to become a part of your program. What is there? Who do they? How do they take? How do they? How do they achieve that goal of get? So I, for whatever weird accounting reasons, I did have to pay for it myself. You did. Yeah. Now Ramon's got a lot of money. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. It was that it was, was one nice. of those things I nice. really wanted it. So, but other labs will pay for that. I don't know. I don't know why he didn't. But if if you go to other labs, they'll they'll let you do it. Also, it's completely legal. If I were to go out with you, since I have the license, as long as I'm there, everyone around me can do whatever. But I have to be on the ground. Wow. So, like a visual observer. So if a, if a student is with a person with a license, simultaneously they're there together, the student can can go through the, can practice it. Mm -hmm. That's good. To, that's so good to know. We're running out of time. I'm, I shouldn't be looking at the clock, but we have to stay on the schedule. Are there other reactions? Anyone want to make a comment about how you feel about Y'all use any fixed wings drones? I I haven't yet, but I know I'm pretty sure Wes Everman, who you guys are going to next week. Has, Wes is going to meet us out at some like the field station next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've never used one, but I've always wanted to. Which I'm sure those are if you have really large large fields. Wes told me earlier this week that he was going to try to bring to bring one to 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 our field to our uh, lab next Thursday. That's the plan. He's going to try. Now, now, does he get need to get permission from anyone to, to take that sign? <laughs> I'm trying to just think about the legality of all of this. It's, it's complicated, <laughs> and some of it feels a little bit not... It feels like a little bit like it's too much sometimes, but... I, I have had my wrist slapped, so I'm I'm kind of just listening to what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> well, we well that's who you are. You listen. You're a careful listener. I just want to say, and then we're going to need to move on. We are so lucky that Avi chose to invest some of his valuable time being a graduate teaching assistant. He's uh, formally. He's responsible for the online version of CS213, but I've had situations where I've needed his help, either with the seed section of 213 or 214, and Avi has always said yes. This is an example of who he is. He has incredible humanity in your technical skills. We're very impressed. 
and we're just very lucky that you were willing to give us your time this afternoon. <coughs> and it could be that at a later time a student will want to talk to you more about this. Are you approachable later in case a student wants to have a follow-up conversation? Of course. Yeah, and you yeah I can... Yeah, you, you can send them my email. They've got your email address. It's on, it's on the syllabus. Great. Students, can we thank him for his time? <laughs> Bobby, we're going to go saddle up, and you've got to get on with your afternoon. So, students, we're going to we'll take a quick break, and then we're, the bus is waiting for us in the usual place. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my, somebody would shoot it. Oh, it's hot. No, you're right. Dr. Patterson. My grandfather just got moved out of the hospital when the So is it okay if I go see him instead of... Oh, see you, Good, good. He actually ended up... He had salmonella. How did, how did he get salmonella? That's a great question. I don't think oh, he knows. How did that matter? Oh Better you go. You go be with your grandfather. All right, we'll see you. Doctor. Would you let me know how it goes? Let, let me know how that goes, Patterson. Um, someone told me that the uh, midterm was due at twelve uh, lunchtime today. Is that right? No, not lunchtime. No, no. I would never ask you to turn anything. Is it due at twelve tonight? Midnight. Okay. Everything. Mid no, no, nothing in the middle of the day. I was talking to Caroline today, and she she made a mistake. With that. So it is oh. supposed to be tonight. Yeah, it's just, whatever. Just, yeah, yeah, like she she made it like a day earlier by accident. Oh, okay. So no, she she no, feels no. bad, okay. but she she fixed oh, it. Oh no, good. Obviously, there are no words to describe how, how much I appreciate what you've done. Of course, you're a teacher. I know nothing about this subject. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur, you know that. But I want to I want to try to learn. I want to try. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sure. Good luck this afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, have fun at the Seed Lab. Yeah, I'm going to go down to the Seed Lab now. And someday, we, when, when my brain is working, <laughs> if, if my brain is working, we need to have a coffee pot conversation about this. Of course. Take hey, good care. You too. Is there anything I need to, like, close the door or anything like that? No. You, no, you don't need to. There's a class coming in here in a little while. Okay. Another class coming in. Take care. You too.